So I'm going to remind you of the inner product, and then I'll tie it with some of our more recent discussion of the spectral theorem. But for the inner product, recall this was some function that ate values from two fields. Uh, for today, I'm going to focus our attention on the complex numbers, Zn. But you can have this exact same discussion of real numbers. Uh, and spits out, uh, ooh, spits out a, a complex number. There we go. So, so it's an inner product, it's some function that satisfies some properties, right? So maybe you can try and remind me what these properties are. Um, the first one is it's, it's almost commutative. It's almost commutative. You almost have that the inner product of VW is W. V, the inner product of W and V, except you need to take complex conjugate. If you're working over the reals, it is commutative. If you're working over the complex numbers, not quite. Similarly, therefore, it's almost bilinear. It's linear in the second term. So you can expand out linearly in the second argument. But then putting these two properties together, if you want to expand in the first argument, you would have to take the complex conjugate of any constants you pull out, right? That's what the first property gives you. And so we say it's kind of like one and a half linear. It's sesquilinear. If you're working over the reals, it's bilinear over the complex numbers sesquilinear. And the third is that this induces a norm. That is, the inner product of V with itself should always be non-negative for all vectors in Cn, and it only equals zero when your vector is zero. So we have this definition. And you know, we could look at examples. So, so the example I'm particularly interested in today is where we're going to introduce some matrix A. And we're going to define the inner product of V and W to be equal to V um, conjugate transpose AW. This is where A is some um, N by N matrix with complex entries. Well, let's take a second to think if this really is in a product. So it's like, does this first property hold? Well, I, I suppose we could, we could work them all out. Like what would be, what would be W, V? And you're like, well, by definition, this would just be W conjugate transpose A, V. But then you're like, what is this? Well, um, if you're, um, but the problem is it's not going to come out to be the same thing, right? I mean, that's why we need to take the conjugates of this. So, so maybe I'll just, I'll just take the conjugate, the complex conjugate of this. And then we can start seeing, okay, that's going to be the same thing as, is since it's a scalar, very good, is the same thing as this complex conjugate, right? This is, this is the argument. So this is just V, a W. Okay, this is not quite the same as what I wanted to be. Thank you, thank you. This, this is what I wanted. And I wanna point out like that's not exactly what I want because I wanted, I wanted this to be equal to V A W, which is the same thing as uh, 
my inner product of V and W. So it's like, how can I get this equality? Well, I can only get that equality if my A is equal to my complex conjugate of A, the conjugate transpose of A. So I need, for this to be an inner product, I need A's conjugate transpose to equal A. So recall, that's what uh, we call Hermitian. I need my A to be Hermitian. That is, I need my A to be self-adjoint. That's another word for it. Its adjoint is equal to itself. But if I have that, I pick my A to be Hermitian. Then I satisfy my first property. Well, matrix is, or, you know, matrix multiplication is linear, so it also satisfies the pro second property. And then, okay, well, we should check really fast it satisfies this third property, but that won't be too bad. So you have um, the inner product of V with itself is just uh, V complex conjugate times A times V. Well, why, why must that be non-zero? I guess it doesn't have to be non-zero. You could, you could imagine cases where it's not. So for example, if you had something like, oh, I don't know, give me, give me an example, one, 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 one uh, row times column. Um, let's make this something like negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one. Then that would come out to be, uh, well, I've already insisted that my A is self-adjoint, but that satisfies this, this is a symmetric matrix, so that's, that's Hermitian. And then you have row times a column Row times column gives me negative two, negative two, one, one, it comes out to be negative four. Uh-oh, like, we're now failing the last condition. Okay, I'm kind of stumbling my way through here because like this isn't true. <laughs> so I need more than just A being Hermitian, I actually need something stronger. I also want to guarantee that this guy is always non-negative. And that may not necessarily be the case. And so I need, I need to introduce a second restraint on this. My second restraint is, is this restraint. And so this is called being positive definite. Definite. So, so let me add that here, where A is self-adjoint and positive definite. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what it means to be positive definite. Okay, so what do I mean by positive definite? Let me give you the definition. So given some matrix A, that's an N by N matrix with complex or real entries, we say A is positive definite. If V star A V is strictly positive for non-zero vectors V, for all non-zero vector Vs inside of Cn. These, these Vs live inside of Cn. Which is exactly the condition we want here. We want it to be always non-zero, except for only zero, the only time this is zero, remember our definition, the only time you have equality, only time we want equality with zero, is when your vector is zero. Well, if your vector is zero, of course that's gonna give you zero, right? So this is, this is the kind of condition we need on A. Okay, so we stumbled through this a little bit, but now we've landed in a place that says in order to, to build an inner product to satisfy these conditions, yeah, I need to be Hermitian, but 
In fact, I need this other property that I need to be positive definite. And so what I'm going to do today is try and unpack what it means to be positive definite. We'll look at some classification of positive definite matrices. And then we're going to end class by saying, in fact, it's not just that this is one example of a kind of matrix that gives you an inner product, but all inner products over Cn look something like this, right? So, so that's the goal for today. So, so let me try to classify positive definite matrices a little bit. And what I want to do is I want to look at, well, maybe first we can develop some about geometric thinking about this. So like, what is this condition really saying? So, so recall, if you have two vectors, the angle between them is given by cosine of that angle is just the one dotted with the other. So if I make one V and I make the other one AV, what this is saying is that V dot AV divided by the magnitude of V times the magnitude of AV, that should give me cosine of the angle between it. But right here, if my A is a matrix that's positive definite, then, well, this is the same thing as V dot AV, working over the complex numbers, that's why that's a complex conjugate, a conjugate transpose. And so we're saying that this guy on top is, is positive, unless V is zero. But if this is positive, then when you scale it, it's still, still positive, right? Like, you know, dividing by these magnitudes still gives you something positive. So I'm just saying the angle between V and AV has to be positive. So, so let's think about this. If A is a positive definite matrix, A is positive definite, that means if you start out with any vector V, and you apply the transformation A to it, it's like, what kinds of things can you get out? Well, your cosine has to be positive. So like, when is cosine positive? What, what can your angle be? The cosine is positive from zero, uh, greater than zero, up until pi, yeah? So, cosine is positive? Oh, 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 from negative pi over two to pi over two. Yeah, from negative pi over two to pi over two. So this angle must be strictly between, you know, like negative 90 degrees and 90 degrees. From negative pi over two to pi over two. Which is saying like, wherever he gets sent to, it has to be within 90 degrees of the original guy. So like you look 90 degrees either direction of him, and you're like, okay, my AV must be getting sent somewhere over here. You know, maybe it gets sent something like this, I don't know. But it can't get sent to this side. You're limited. Do you have to be somewhere, somewhere in this region? And so that's one way to think about what a positive definite matrix is doing, is it's limiting the range of motion of how far your matrix can move your vector. Good. Okay. But again, that's not necessarily the most helpful classification. You know, it's like, okay, it tells you a little bit geometrically about what's going on with these matrices, but what do they look like? You know, what kinds of matrices are positive definite? What kinds of matrices are not? And so uh, maybe what I'm going to do is I want to look at a, a definition. Uh, but before I should say, um, this term positive definite, there's a related notion that we should also be thinking about, and that's positive semi-definite. And the only difference is for positive semi-definite, you're allowed to actually hit zero for non-zero entries. So semi-definite just means you're non-negative. And if you move to semi-definite, that's just going to mean that this is greater than or equal to zero. And so now you can actually hit from negative 90 to 90 degrees. So things that are semi-definite can actually be hit that line. 
So two very closely related definitions. We'll think about both of them and try and see what we can say about them. So, so let me give you an example. And, and maybe you can tell me if this particular matrix is definite, positive definite, or is it positive semi-definite, or is it neither? So, so let's look at a concrete example. Let's consider the matrix. A equals 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. So this is identity minus the transpose. No, no, not. It's just a one minus one minus one. one. Nice symmetric matrix. So is it definite? Is it semi-definite? Is it neither? Well, to find out, we need to apply the definition. So we need to take some arbitrary vector v. So let's let V just be some arbitrary vector x, y. And then your V star A, V comes out to be the conjugate transpose of x and y times your matrix times the original vector V. And so let's do a little math, see how this comes out. Here I have the conjugate transpose of my vector times rho by column gives me x minus y. Rho times column gives me minus x plus y. Multiplying these out, x, so rho times column, so x bar times x minus x bar times y, minus y bar times x, plus y bar times y. So we call x and y here just complex numbers. This is, this is something in, for us, C2. And so it's like, well, is this like always positive or at least is it always not negative? You look at it and you're like, well, what is this? Do you recognize this? Is this familiar? Well, let me rewrite it in perhaps a suggestive way. This is just complex conjugate of x minus complex conjugate of y times x minus y. Because then you get x bar x minus x bar y minus y bar x plus y bar y. Yeah. But what this is really saying is it's just x minus y times its complex conjugate. The complex conjugate of x minus complex conjugate of y is the complex conjugate of x minus y. And so if you have a number times its complex conjugate, that's just going to give you the magnitude of that complex number squared. Yeah, if this is like a plus bi times a minus bi, you just get a squared plus b squared. So what can you tell me about this guy? Can it be negative? No. Can it be zero? When is it zero? Yeah, so there are non-zero times when this can be zero. So, so, so this can hit zero. So, you, so for example, you have that if you selected your v to be something like one, one, right? That would give you out the value zero then your v star a v would be zero. So it's not that it's only zero for when v is zero, so it can hit zero for other values. So it's not positive definite. This is an example of a matrix that's positive semi-definite. 
This is an example of a matrix that's positive semi-definite. Happy with that? How to, how to check? OK. Well, since we have the matrix up here, let's see what else we can say about it. What if I wanted to find the eigenvalues of this matrix? What would they be? Let's just do it in this concrete example, and then we're going to make an observation. So what are my eigenvalues? Well, to find the eigenvalues of a matrix, you need to calculate its characteristic polynomial, which for this guy is your matrix minus lambda times the density. So it's 1 minus lambda, 1 minus lambda, and these other entries are the same. Calculate the determinant of that. So that gives you 1 minus lambda squared minus minus 1 times minus 1, so it's minus positive 1. So it's just lambda squared minus 2 lambda, which you can factor as to lambda minus, lambda minus 2. Your eigenvalues are your roots. It's where this guy equals 0. So your eigenvalues would just be lambda is either 0 or 2. Okay. Note in particular, though, these eigenvalues are non-negative. Why does that make sense that the eigenvalues are non-negative? Good. If we go back to a geometric interpretation, if this guy v was an eigenvector with eigenvalue like negative 1, he would get sent to you know, negative v is this guy on this side. If this is my v, my negative v would be this. But that violates the definition of what it means to be positive, semi-definite, or positive definite, right? Like, you can't do that. And so let me just turn this into a little theorem. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a theorem here. We're going to run out of room in a second, but, but I think we can make it fit. So here's my theorem. First of all, to even talk about, to even talk about eigenvalues as, as real value entries, I mean, these, in principle, these could have come out to be complex. But it's because I started with a matrix that's Hermitian that I know my eigenvalues to be real, right? Like, these are real because my original matrix A was self-adjoint. It was, it was Hermitian. A, A conjugate transpose equals itself. So if we begin some self-adjoint or Hermitian matrix. So recall that's just saying that A conjugate transpose equals A. Well, now I know that my eigenvalues would be real numbers. But I claim that if you have such a matrix, the following conditions are equivalent. The following are equivalent. One, A is positive semi-definite. Two, A has non-negative eigenvalues. And we've already just given an argument for why one implies two, right? Just based on geometric interpretation, based on cosine. Well, now we want a third condition. But before I move to a third condition, what if instead of saying positive semi-definite, I came over here and I just wanted this to be positive definite? So, so remember, the difference between semi-definite and definite is if it's definite, it's always positive for non-zero v. It's like, OK, I need this product to always be positive. So what does that tell me about what my eigenvalues can be? 
Why positive? Why can't I have an eigenvalue of zero? Yeah, if, if V was some non-negative thing with an eigenvalue of zero, that would be saying that V gets sent to the zero vector. So that would be saying that your AV is the zero vector. But you can't have that if you're positive definite, because if V is non-zero, you want your AV to come out to be something non-zero, right? So, so if A has, if you start out with A being not just positive semi-definite, but positive definite, then you say something stronger, it has to have positive eigenvalues. Okay, let, let me look at one more, one more statement. The next one we're going to get for free. We can write A as U D U conjugate transpose, where U is unitary and D has non negative entries in the diagonal non-negative diagonal. All the entries in the diagonal are non-negative. Why, why do we have this? Where does this come from? Well, that's just exactly your spectral theorem, right? This is our spectral theorem, which says that if you have any normal matrix A, ah, my A is self-adjoint, which you recall if A is self-adjoint, that implies that A is normal, because to be normal, you must satisfy that A conjugate transpose A is A, A conjugate transpose. But if A is equal to its conjugate transpose, that's just A squared on both sides. So we can apply the spectral theorem. And the spectral theorem says you can write A as some unitary matrix, a unitary change of base, times your diagonal, where the values on your diagonal are just your eigenvalues times the conjugate transpose of u, right? That's our spectral theorem. And so since our eigenvalues are non-negative, d is going to have non-negative entries on the diagonal. If we had started out with a matrix that was positive definite, then in fact our eigenvalues are positive, so d will not just have non-negative entries on the diagonal, but d will have positive entries on the diagonal. Okay, so, so we could do that for this matrix, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to belabor the point with this matrix, but it's like this matrix A, we could just write A as some unitary matrix times the diagonal matrix would just be zero, two, times the complex conjugate of that unitary matrix, right? With a unitary matrix where we, you just find the eigenvectors corresponding to zero and two, and you scale them to be unit length. I believe the unitary matrix just comes out to be root two over two, negative one, 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 one. You can, you can verify that, that this is the corresponding eigenvectors for the eigenvalues zero and two. One more condition. I wanna show these are ultimately all equivalent. So I can't just show that they're all, like one implies the next implies the next. I then have to loop back at some point, right? And then I'll show that if you have one, you can get to any other one, they're all logical equivalent. But let me give you one fourth condition. I claim that I can write A equal to B conjugate transpose B for some matrix B. Well, we're going to use our decomposition. So I already know that I can write A as U, D, U conjugate transpose. So what's a really good candidate for B? It's like, well, I want when I multiply two of these guys together to get this, right? It's like how? 
How am I going to multiply two matrices together and get this? Anyone have any ideas? Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. Square root of d. What do you mean by the square root of d? So like, what is the square root of d? Or d to the 1 half? Well, it makes sense since d is diagonal. By square root of d, we just mean the matrix that takes the square root of all these values on the diagonal. Why can we talk about such a matrix? Because we've just said that all those numbers are non-negative. So we can talk about the square roots, right? So, so these are all real non-negative numbers, and you can take the square roots, and you'll still have nice real numbers along um, the matrix here. So I'm going to define b. I'm actually going to define, I think, I think the way to do it is square root of d times u conjugate transpose. Because then b conjugate transpose times b is the conjugate transpose of this guy, which is u times the square root of d conjugate transpose times a copy of b, which is the square root of d times u conjugate transpose. But it's like, what is the conjugate transpose of d? It's already diagonal, so don't need, transpose doesn't do anything. And we just said all these values are real. So since all the re values are real, taking the complex conjugate doesn't change anything. So because of the way we set it up, the conjugate transpose of d square root is just the square root of d. Great. So we have that implication. Ah, let's, let's think back. What if we had not just non-negative entries along the diagonal, but positive entries along the diagonal? What if these had all been positive? Then my b would be some square root of d with all positive diagonal u conjugate transpose, right? So, so here, if this was all positive, I would have that my b is this with positive. So, so, so if these are all positive, then, then you, know, you have no zeros here. But if none of these are zeros, then that would mean that our determinant of d, well, we know it to be just the product of these. It's just the product of lambda 1 through lambda n square rooted. So if none of these are 0, if we're looking at positive definite matrix, that has to be a non-zero value, right? Our determinant is non-zero. And if our determinant is non-zero, that means that the square root of d has an inverse. So root d invertible is well-defined, or root d is invertible. But u is a unitary matrix. So u conjugate transpose is just the inverse of u. And so I can now calculate b inverse. It's just going to be the inverse of this, which is first take the inverse of the first one, which is u, times the inverse of the second one, which is now like d to the minus 1 half. We can only invert b if this determinant's non-zero. This determinant's non-zero only if all your eigenvalues are non-zero, which only happens if you're positive definite. So when you're positive definite, it's not just that you can write a is equal to b conjugate transpose b for some matrix. It's that you can do this for some invertible, for an invertible matrix. Okay. So I'm giving you two theorems at the same time. <laughs> but one theorem is just exactly the similar to the other one is just you have to strengthen a word in each line. OK, so now what we want to do is we want to complete the logic loop. We want to say, OK, now we want to show that this last condition gives us back the first one. And once we show that, now you have a nice classification of positive definite or positive semi-definite matrices. And hopefully it gives us a little bit better understanding or what these matrices are like. And so the way we're going to do that is remember our definition of positive semi-definite is I want to show that this guy is always, always non-negative, always positive, depending on if you're doing semi-definite or definite. So let's think about that expression. What is V star AV? 
Well, I've just said that we can write A as B conjugate transpose B. So that's the same thing as V star B star BV. But that's the same thing as BV dotted with itself. So that's the same thing as the magnitude of B times V squared. A magnitude, by definition, is always non-negative. So we've just recovered the fact that A is positive semi-definite. If, however, we had the stronger condition that B was invertible, if we're thinking about the case where B is invertible, That means that the null space of V has dimension zero. The nullity, so, so the determinant is non-zero, the nullity of B is non-zero. In particular, you would have that your BV is non-zero whenever your V is non-zero. And so you would get that the only time you achieve zero is for uh, if and only if your v is equal to zero, which is exactly the definition of positive definite. Okay, so we did a lot there. We had four conditions. We showed each one apply to the next, coming back to the loop. Therefore, if you have any of these conditions, it's logically equivalent to any other one. So let me pause and just see if you have any questions on, on that result. Okay, so hopefully this has done two things. First, it takes this definition we had at the beginning that seemed kind of weird, right? And shows actually this is like a really interesting class of, of matrices. It's exactly those matrices that have non-negative or, or positive eigenvalues, right? And, and then this fact may be a little surprising. Like those are exactly the matrices you can decompose as the conjugate transpose of some matrix times itself, right? And if you want it to be positive eigenvalues, that's exactly the class of matrices that has some invertible B, which is the B conjugate transpose times itself gives you the matrix. So, so like, why does this help? Well, I wanna go back to our opening observation, which has now been erased. But, but what we said at the beginning is that we can build an inner product. So here's the main theorem I wanna to get to today. So if we're given a to, again, we, we need this to make sense. We need A to be some uh, Hermitian, or that is self-adjoint matrix. So, so we need it to be self-adjoint for any of this to apply. But if we begin with some self-adjoint matrix, then I want to say, well, maybe the way to say it is this. Maybe the way to say it is this. Um, the function, that uh, takes in two vectors from Cn and spits out a single complex number C is an inner product if and only if we can write it as some V conjugate transpose a w where your a is a self adjoint positive definite matrix We've already shown one direction. That was, that was the beginning of the class. We already showed the upward direction that if you have a matrix 
that's self-adjoint positive definite, that it checks off all the, all the, you know, satisfies the definition of being an inner product. So we already did this direction. But the stronger claim now, or I suppose just the opposite direction, maybe a more interesting claim, is that if you have any inner product over Cn or over Rn, you know, get the same thing with the real numbers, that it has to look like this. So like you should think this is a little bit counterintuitive or surprising maybe, right? Like we've seen lots of examples of inner products. And so it's like, why, why must it look like this? Maybe it's not that surprising because we've kind of been playing this game all, all semester. It's like, if you have some, something like this, secretly it's represented by a matrix, right? If you have a linear transformation, pick the right, some right basis, secretly it's represented by a matrix. What's interesting here though, is this is independent of some choice of basis. It's just like secretly, he's of this form. It's not like up to picking some right basis. So, so the closest thing we have so far is, is given in a product, we've shown that the inner product between V and W can be represented as a dot product between V and W if you pick a nice basis. So for some orthonormal basis B, you can write it this way. And B is the basis that you create by using your inner product and Gram-Schmidt, right? So using Gram-Schmidt with the, this, the inner product, whatever it is, you can create an orthonormal basis B that allows you to represent the inner product as a dot product. So that's what we've done before, right? Like this, this was a result from a couple of weeks ago that if you pick your, your basis correctly, you can think of this as a dot product. But in many ways, this is quite a bit stronger, right? This is saying like, you, you don't have to think about a particular basis. This is, this is gonna be for any basis. So how are we gonna get from here to here? Well, step one, there's a change of basis matrix P that lets us change things between the basis B and our standard elementary basis. And, and so I'm going to denote this like this. This, this, is, this is the uh, change of basis between your elementary basis and B, where your elementary basis E is just the basis that has, you know, one in the first place, zeros everywhere else, one in the second place, zeros everywhere else, and so on until you go one in the last place. Right, this is your elementary basis. Up to scaling by complex numbers, this gives you Cn. So, if we have this change of basis matrix, then this guy up here tells us that we can write this equality as now the inner product of V and W is, well, let's, let's write P V. Because P times V is the same thing as V expressed in the basis B. V is something in your elementary basis. You multiply it by P, it takes it from the elementary basis to the basis B. So this is the same thing as V expressed in that basis B, dotted with PW. Because PW is exactly what you get when you change W from the elementary basis to whatever your basis B is. We, we happy with that? So this then is exactly the same thing as, well, dot product over complex numbers is multiplication by conjugate transpose. So this is V conjugate transpose P conjugate transpose P W. But what is P conjugate transpose times P?
It's some matrix that's written as something conjugate transpose times itself. And by our theorem, that means that P in that case, conjugate transpose times P, is going to be a positive semi-definite matrix. So we've just written it as V conjugate transpose times a positive semi-definite matrix by our theorem. This is a positive semi-definite matrix. times W. Hence this class of, oh, I wrote positive definite. This should be, is it positive definite? Ah, why is it actually positive definite? Why can I drop the semi? Change the basis is invertible. So in fact, it's an invertible guy. Why is it invertible? Well, P inverse, I mean, this is invertible because P inverse is just the guy that instead of changing you from E to B is a change of basis from B to E, right? So this is an invertible matrix. So in fact, when you multiply its conjugate transpose by itself, you get a positive definite matrix. Cool. Okay, so we'll stop there for today.